Coverage on the following stories. Why it's good for the whole economy for agriculture to receive fair prices. The food industry debate and chain store profit turnover. What's new? Milk distributors turn to NFO. Hearings on meat imports. NFO hay to Japan and kill the beef tax. Predictions of exodus from Midwest farms if conditions don't improve. And Paulson from Washington says NFO has solution. For these news stories, here's NFO news analyst Phil Allen. I'm introducing Paul Lund, director of the new membership division for the NFO. Before coming to the headquarters staff of the National Farmers Organization, he was a vocational agriculture instructor in Colorado. He has some thoughts on why it's good for our whole economy for agriculture to get fair prices. Paul, can you consider agriculture in the same terms as export-import? Yes, you can, Phil. I would like to, at this time, have all the listening audience think of imports and exports as a rural situation rather than an international one. For a minute, just think of your rural town as an importer of clothes, shoes, and retail exchange items, all being sold at your local stores at a fair market value with a percent return to the local merchants handling that product. All of the products sold in this town are sold basically in the same manner, with a local merchant putting a price tag on that product. The days of horse trading between buyer and seller are practically non-existent. If you want the product, you either buy there or go elsewhere and shop. Let's now think of agricultural products being exported from this rural town. They are presently being exported at 68% of parity which means to us in American agriculture a loss of 32 cents on the dollar, or 32 cents less than a fair price. We read and hear consistently through our media that we must maintain a balance of trade internationally so that the dollars balance imports to exports. If we continue to import into rural America and sell these products at a fair market price and continue to export agricultural products at a loss of 32 cents on the dollar, it is no wonder why our rural towns are looking at the state for more financial assistance, and the state governments are looking at the federal government for more aid. And last but not least, the federal government asking the international money system for more operating capital, and so it goes. Continuing spiraling inflation, recessions, and more control over the people of the land through added tax burdens. With all this money that is exchanging hands, there are requirements and stipulations that accompany this money, which again means more control. Our economy has and always will be an agrarian-based economy. We hear economists stating that we have to stimulate the economy, put people back to work, tax rebates, get construction going. All of these are short-term stimulations. The one area that can stimulate the economy faster than any of the others is American agriculture. And for some unknown reason, the one that is overlooked as being the building block of our whole economy. There has only been four true parity years in American agriculture, 1948, 49, 50, and 51. Ironically, those were the only four years that we ever paid towards the principle of our national deficit. Well, Paul, you've described pretty well the way it's been. Can we learn from history? Yes, we can, Phil. I've always assumed that we have learned from history. It has a way of repeating itself. Why then don't our economists and political leaders reevaluate this inflationary economy that we are in and open their eyes to a long-term stimulation of the economy through fair farm prices? My answer to this is cheap food for the masses at the expense of the family-type farm. The American consumer is presently spending 16.5% of her disposable income after taxes for food, the cheapest fed people in the whole world. They don't seem to realize that because of this national cheap food policy that their tax base is going to absorb their additional savings that they would have for more vacations, automobiles, and luxuries, etc. I ask you farmers and the listening audience to stop and evaluate your local town. Is there a financial problem? And if so, what is the cause of that problem and how can the problem be corrected? And also please remember the fourth paragraph of the FFA Creed. I believe in less dependence on begging and more power in bargaining. And to our consumer customers and the listening audience, you will continue to be the best fed people in the world at the cheapest price 
but in the future not at the expense of the American farmers, because we are all going to work together to solve this curable problem that we now have, inflation. That was Paul Lund, director of the new membership division of the NFO. There's a growing number of signs in the news that there's a confrontation approaching. The food industry corporations will collide with the consumer interest. The arena will be in Washington and elsewhere. What are the signs? Well, the food industry lobby is tuning up. For instance, the recent piece by Edith Efron in TV Guide, where she warned the network news reporters and urged their superiors in network and station management to lay off the food industry. She asserted there's a socialist plot to hang more regulations on the food corporations. She even linked words like Maoist and socialist and the liberal lemmings who don't understand, etc. And then there's an editorial we heard recently on KFAB, a big regional power station at Omaha, Nebraska, saying that the high price of coffee isn't the fault of the grocery chains, but the Brazilians and the speculators, which may be true in part, even though a percentage markup on a higher wholesale price still leaves the retailer with more profit no matter who caused the higher wholesale price. Then there's Senator Proxmire of Wisconsin, who ought to know better, writing to the Wall Street Journal Reader's column, echoing the chain store association's whiskery old argument that their profits aren't unduly high because they, on the average, charge only 1% profit on dollar sales. Proxmire forgot to add that the alleged 1% gets charged oftener than most any other retail operation. For instance, the turnover in the strictly food items in a grocery store is once a week. Some items like dairy and meat, the stock is turned over almost daily, and the markups on these items are more than 1%. On this point, NFO Vice President Devon Woodland had an exchange with chain store representatives two years ago at the close of a Senate Agriculture Committee hearing at Louisville, Kentucky, chaired by Senator Walter Huddleston. Woodland asked them the question about how often food items turn over, a question which should be asked at every hearing on this subject. But I asked the chains very specifically if they would agree to 1% on every gross dollar sale was their profit. They said, yes, that's how it happened. I said, then I understand this. You take a dollar, you go out and buy a dollar's worth of produce. You bring the dollar into the store and you sell it for a dollar and one cent. Yes. You take the one cent and put it in the profit column. What do you do with the dollar? Well, we take that dollar and go back and buy another dollar's worth, bring it in, make 1% on it, put it in the profit column, go back and buy another dollar's worth and bring it in. I said, how often then do you take that dollar and reinvest it each year. How often do you do this? How many times a week do you do it? So I understand what you're doing. Well, he said, we can't really determine that because there's some items that don't turn over, but maybe once every two months. And I said, would it be brooms? Would it be uh, toiletry in the grocery store? Would it be pantyhose? Would it be those dry goods in the store? And they said, basically, that's right. Well, I said, let's forget about that. And they said, you can't do that because it's an overhead cost. And the food items have to carry the overhead cost of the dry goods. I said, when you guys get in the food business, let the dry goods handle the dry goods. But let's talk about food. How often does food turn over in your store? Well, uh, I knew milk turned over every two days. I knew bakery goods turned over about every two days. So I knew some items moved quite frequently. And they said food items turn over once every seven days. OK, what did they just tell me? that they make 1% every time the dollar turns over, and they turn it every seven days or once a week, 52 weeks in a year, they make 52% on $1. That's what their margin of profits are. Now, if I invest a dollar on my farm and buy fertilizer or seed and make 1%, I make a dollar and one percent, one cent annually. They make it every time they turn that dollar, and they turn it every week. 52% on $1. The chain store representatives NFO's Devon Woodland questioned that day in Louisville were from one of the three biggest grocery chains in the country. This important nationwide debate on the food industry is well worth watching. What's new in the NFO Reporter? This is the official publication of the National Farmers Organization. It goes to all NFO members, to members of Congress, to the policy people in the Department of Agriculture, and to the press and the broadcasters. The lead story on page one tells about big advances in NFO dairy bargaining. 
Here's Doris McElwain with more on that. The headline in the reporter says, Major Midwest distributors turn to NFO for their milk supplies. Ed Graff, head of the Dairy Commodities Department for NFO, announced contracting with Beatrice Creameries for full supply of milk at their St. Joseph plant, requiring 6 million pounds. That's 120 tankers a month. At the same time, he announced that NFO dairymen are providing partial supply to Beatrice Creamery plants in Topeka, Kansas, and Lincoln, Nebraska. NFO, last month, announced signing a supply contract with a major distributor in Chicago, Country Delight, and negotiations are underway to supply two other nationwide handlers. Ed Graff said, with these new Midwest outlets, we are prepared to enroll and immediately start marketing milk for members in the four-state area, including Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. On page 7 of the current issue of the NFO Reporter, it says in the headline, NFOers will appear at U.S. Trade Commission's hearings on meat import restrictions. Martha Swaim has a review of that. Here's a brief summary of what the NFO cattle people will recommend at the hearings. First, that the Meat Import Act of 1964 be rewritten or placed back into effect to limit what a given country can export to the United States. Second, greatly reduce the percentage of imported meat we allow in. It's now around 7 to 8 percent by law. Third, that meat imported into the United States should be required to pass the same rigid inspections for cleanliness and healthfulness that domestic meats are required to pass and be labeled as to the country of origin. These hearings are being held at Rapid City, Kansas City, Dallas, New York City, and Washington, D.C. NFO specialty commodities are in the news. Here's Shelley Robertson, who heads that department. We've signed a contract for export of NFO hay to Japan. We'll be supplying 500 tons for each of the next nine months. Also, NFO hay from California is being exported to Mexico under NFO contract. We've also made good progress in sunflowers, blueberries, and edible beans. Our sunflower growers have signed up three times as many acres this year as last year at this time. Up to 40% of the sunflowers committed for 1977 have been sold on contracts with volume premiums. Blueberry processors have contacted us, and negotiations are underway. And we're moving Navy beans out of Michigan and Idaho. The latest NFO reporter has the big center feature with pictures showing NFO's river barge system. There is a map showing 19 NFO barge points. It's part of NFO's nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. The lead editorial in the current NFO reporter says, Kill the beef tax. Registrations to vote on a proposal to assess beef producers one-third of a percent on cattle transactions were from June 7th to 17th. The actual voting will be from July 5th to 15th. The editorial urges a no vote. It's actually a proposal to build up a 40 to $60 million fund to try to get more customers for beef by advertising. Experience shows that Americans raise or lower their beef consumption not because of advertising, but by income level. Also, advertising campaigns, if they have any effect, they result in one meat product increasing at the expense of another. NFO people believe in strength all along a broad front of commodities by bargaining, not building advertising war chests so one commodity can compete against another. A recent issue of U.S. News and World Report says, unless conditions improve drastically in the next few months, some observers are predicting an exodus from Midwestern farms, particularly of young farmers. The article quotes a Kansas farm agent. Too many of our people don't have enough equity left to get a loan to go another time around, and many of the smaller banks are loaned up and can't let go of any more money. It quotes Bernard Johnson, president of the Production Credit Association of Fargo, North Dakota, he says 105 farmers who borrowed from the association in 1976 lost a total of $4 million, or about $40,000 each. He comments some of our farmers are in a real financial strain. Many are just hanging on by their bootstraps, and some we've had to close out. The problem is, says the PCA president at Fargo, there is no profit at $2.50 for wheat. 
Then the article in U.S. News and World Report continues, In the Grain Belt, not only do the farmers suffer when profits disappear, but entire communities as well. Del Severson, appliance manager for a furniture store near Fergus Falls, Minnesota, says that sales have been off since the first of the year, and, as he puts it, the drought really hurt us. And at Jamestown, North Dakota, Robert Melland, owner of an international harvester dealership, says that his sales are off 35% from last year and that his employees are worried about their jobs. U.S. News summarizes the expected production totals around the world for wheat and other crops, more than 2 billion bushels for the third consecutive year in wheat. Also, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reports that growing conditions throughout the world are better than normal. World grain reserves are approaching an all-time high. Russia, one of the best customers for American grain, enjoyed a record harvest in 1976 and is expected to have its third largest Russian wheat crop this year. The U.S. News article cites Thomas E. Ostrander's experience. He's a Wellington, Kansas wheat farmer. It cost him about $100 an acre to produce dryland wheat. The average yield is 30 bushels per acre, leaving the farmer about $40 an acre in the hole at current prices. USDA says grain farmers spent $89 billion to produce crops in 1976, which is 9% more than in 1975. Production costs for the average farm in 1976 totaled just over $32,000, up from 29,000 in 1975. Arnold Paulson, the director of the National Organization for Raw Materials, spoke recently from Washington, where his organization has recently established offices. Paulson said this. In spite of all these facts and reports from bankers, the administration has threatened to veto the entire farm bill if Congress increases the loan and target price above the limits of the administration recommendation. Congressman Nolan of Minnesota labeled the 1977 House Farm Program proposal the worst farm bill in 23 years. Congress has knuckled under to the threats of a presidential veto for a farm program that is nothing more than funeral expenses for the tens of thousands of dying farmers, ranchers, and communities. If the Congress doesn't wake up and take proper action, agriculture is facing the darkest days since the Great Depression of the 1930s. This is not a story of gloom or doom, but actual facts revealed by bankers in a government study. Agriculture in the nation needs immediate and drastic help, or the entire country will be in serious trouble. Yet the government has been the cause, for the most part, of our economic problems, and the time has now come for the people to take the bull by the horns and solve their own problems. This means that farmers and ranchers must band together, not in many groups, but in one marketing group, and price their production at the marketplace like all other good businessmen do. Never in history have conditions been riper, more opportune for farmers and ranchers throughout the nation to take a good close look at the program the National Farmers Organization offers to solve the price and marketing problems for agriculture once and for all. The time has come for all farmers, ranchers, to band together, to work together, to market together, to price their production together, and earn their fair share of the national income so agriculture can at least remain solvent. Why not check into the NFO program now and discover for yourself if this isn't the route that the American farmers should go? That was Arnold Paulson with a report from Washington, D.C. The American farmer and rancher really have no one else but themselves to blame for low farm prices. The NFO is the pioneer of agricultural collective bargaining and is the only organization with the structure and capability of getting the job done, cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Remember, cooperation is the key, and NFO is the farmer's only hope. NFO has found the secret to help all the farmers, help all the farmers. 
help all the farmers. NFO has found the method with a good plan of action for the justice at the marketplace. NFO has found the secret to solve many problems, solve many problems, solve many problems. NFO has found the secret to solve many problems in the good old USA. NFO has found the answer, we must bargain collective, bargain collective, bargain collective. NFO has found the secret, we must bargain collective, it's legal and it is fair. One more time, NFO has found the answer, farmers must sell together, you must sell together, you must sell together. NFO has Farmers must sail together. Join the NFO today.